10 Minute Murder contains depictions of actual crimes. What you are about to hear is real and violent in nature. Discretion is advised. This is 10 Minute Murder. Welcome to 10 Minute Murder, the brief and bingeable true crime podcast. I'm Joe, the host, and thanks for being here. This is the third and final part of the Ted Bundy series. In part one, you heard about his early life, how he grew up, how he was like as a teen, relationships, and how he had two completely different faces. If you haven't listened to that one yet, go back and listen to that, and it builds the framework for Bundy as a person, giving you an insight into his effortless manipulation of the people around him and his possible motivation for becoming the serial killer that he became, which you'll learn more about in this episode. In part two, we talked about the sadistic monster that used his charm and good looks to lure women to rape, murder, and mutilate. In this last part, it's more of the same, but with court cases where he represented himself for a portion of the time, his multiple escapes from prison, and his ultimate execution. This is Ted Bundy, part three. On August 16, 1975, Ted Bundy was cruising around a residential area in Granger, which is a suburb of Salt Lake City, before the sun was even up. Utah Highway Patrolman Bob Hayward saw him and was suspicious. As soon as Bundy spotted the patrol car, he took off, trying to leave the area at a high rate of speed. Well, as fast as a Volkswagen Beetle could take you, anyway. Realizing he couldn't get away, Ted pulled over. The patrolman immediately noticed that the passenger seat from the car had been unbolted from the floor and placed into the back seat. Bundy had modified the car to make kidnapping easier for him. The patrolman looked around in Ted's car and spotted two ski masks, one of them made from pantyhose. He also found a crowbar, handcuffs, trash bags, a coil of rope, an ice pick, and other items that the patrolman assumed to be burglary tools. Bundy explained that the ski mask was for skiing. He had found the handcuffs while he was digging through a dumpster, as one does, and the rest were common household items. He was taken into custody anyway, where a detective, Jerry Thompson, remembered a similar suspect car description from a 1974 kidnapping case and remembered a phone call from Liz, warning them about her boyfriend, Ted Bundy. In a search of Bundy's apartment, police found a guide to Colorado ski resorts with a check mark by the Wildwood Inn and a brochure that advertised the Viewmont High School play Bountiful, where Deborah Kent, one of his victims, had disappeared. The police did not have sufficient evidence to detain Bundy, and he was released on his own recognizance. Bundy later said that searchers missed a hidden collection of Polaroid photographs of his victims, which he destroyed after he was released. Salt Lake City police placed Bundy under surveillance, and Detective Thompson flew to Seattle with two other detectives to interview Liz. She told them that in the year prior to Bundy's move to Utah, she had discovered objects that she, quote, couldn't understand in her house and in Bundy's apartment. These items included crutches, a bag of plaster of Paris that he admitted that he had stolen from a medical supply house, and a meat cleaver that was never used for cooking. Additional objects included surgical gloves, an oriental knife in a wooden case that he kept in the glove compartment of his car, and a sack full of women's clothing. Bundy was perpetually in debt, and Liz suspected that he had stolen almost everything of significant value that he had. When she confronted him over a new TV and stereo, he aggressively warned her that if she told anyone, that he'd break her neck. She said Bundy became very upset whenever she considered cutting her hair, which was long and parted in the middle. She would sometimes wake up in the middle of the night to find Ted under the bed covers with a flashlight, examining her body. He kept a lug wrench taped halfway up the handle in the trunk of her car, which was another Volkswagen Beetle, which he often borrowed, saying it was for protection. The detectives confirmed that Bundy had not been with Liz on any of the nights during the Pacific Northwest victims had vanished, nor on the day Ott and Noslin were abducted. Shortly thereafter, Liz was interviewed by Seattle homicide detective Kathy McChesney and learned of the existence of Stephanie Brooks and her brief engagement to Bundy around Christmas of 1973. 
He destroyed those Polaroid photos because Ted knew the police were onto him, but just didn't quite have enough evidence. Yet. So he also knew that his car was a liability. So he got rid of that too. He sold it to a teenager in Midvale. Utah police said not so fast and impounded the car. FBI techs took the car apart, searching for any evidence that could link Bundy to any of the crimes they suspected him of. They found hair from three different women. Women that didn't know each other and would have no reason for their hair to be found together with the others. The only link was Bundy. On October 2nd, Carol DeRanch identified Ted as the man she barely escaped from after being kidnapped. She had been shopping at a mall where a man, claiming to be a police detective, told her that someone had tried to steal her car and that she needed to follow him to go file a police report. She thought it sounded sketchy, but went with Officer Rosalind anyway. That's what he called himself. When they got to Ted's brown beetle, they got inside. He immediately placed one handcuff on her wrist and tried to hit her with a crowbar. She fought back and managed to get away. After being positively ID'd, Bundy was charged with aggravated kidnapping and attempted criminal assault. After a $15,000 bailout by Ted's parents, he was free. Before the kidnapping trial, Ted stayed with Liz in Seattle. The police in Seattle did not yet have enough evidence to arrest him for any of the murders in the Pacific Northwest, but kept a close watch on him. Liz said, When Ted and I stepped out on the porch to go somewhere, so many unmarked police cars started up that it sounded like the beginning of the Indy 500. In November of that year, what they called the Aspen Summit took place. Three main Bundy investigators from three different states met in Aspen, Colorado, to exchange and compare information with 30 detectives and prosecutors from five states. They were all convinced that Ted Bundy is who they were looking for, but needed more substantial evidence before they could charge him. In February 1976, Bundy stood trial for the Durant kidnapping. On the advice of his attorney, Bundy waived his right to a jury due to the negative publicity surrounding the case. After a four-day bench trial and a weekend of deliberation, the judge found him guilty of kidnapping and assault. In June, he was sentenced to 1 to 15 years in the Utah State Prison. In October, Ted was found hiding in the bushes in the prison yard, carrying an apparent escape kit, roadmaps, airline schedules, and a social security card. For that, he spent several weeks in solitary confinement. Later that month, Colorado authorities charged him with Carolyn Campbell's murder. After a period of resistance, he waived extradition proceedings and was transferred to Aspen in January 1977. On June 7, 1977, Bundy was transported from the Garfield County Jail in Glenwood Springs to Pitkin County Courthouse in Aspen for a preliminary hearing. Bundy served as his own attorney and was excused by the judge for wearing handcuffs or leg shackles. During a recess, he asked to visit the courthouse's law library to research his case. While shielded from his guard's view behind a bookcase, he opened a window and jumped to the ground from the second story injuring his right ankle as he landed. After taking off his outer layer of clothing, he walked through Aspen as roadblocks were being set up in its outskirts. He hiked south onto Aspen Mountain. Near its summit, he broke into a hunting cabin and stole food, clothes, and a rifle. The following day, he left the cabin and continued south toward the town of Crested Butte. He got himself lost in the forest. For two days, he wandered around the mountain, not knowing where he was or where he was going missing two trails that led downward to his intended destination. On June 10th, he broke into a camping trailer on Maroon Lake, 10 miles south of Aspen, taking food and a ski parka. But instead of continuing south, he walked back north toward Aspen, eluding roadblocks and search parties along the way. Three days later, he stole a car at the edge of the Aspen golf course. Cold, sleep-deprived, and in constant pain from his sprained ankle, he drove back into Aspen, where two police officers noticed a car weaving in and out of his lane and pulled him over. Ted Bundy had been a fugitive for six days. Inside the car were maps of the mountain area around Aspen that prosecutors were using to demonstrate the location of Carolyn Campbell's body, as his own attorney Bundy had rights of discovery, indicating that his escape was not a spontaneous act but had been planned. Back in jail in Glenwood Springs, Bundy ignored the advice of his friends and legal advisors to stay put. The case against him, already weak at best, was deteriorating steadily as pretrial motions consistently resolved in his favor and significant bits of evidence were ruled inadmissible. He had a pretty good chance of acquittal in the Colorado murder charge, and beating the charge in court would have probably discouraged future prosecutors 
unless all of the evidence was rock solid. He would have to serve another 18 months, maybe, for the kidnapping conviction and be out free. But Ted Bundy did not listen to the people around him. He hatched a new plan of escape. He got a detailed floor plan of the jail and a hacksaw blade from other inmates and $500 in cash smuggled in over a six-month period by Carol Ann Boone. During the evenings, while other prisoners were showering, Ted was sawing the cell bars with that blade. He lost 35 pounds to fit into the crawl space located in the room right outside of his cell. In the weeks that followed, he made a series of practice runs, exploring the space. Multiple reports from an informant of movement within the cell during the night were not investigated. By late 1977, the impending trial in Aspen had become highly debated and a media spectacle. So Bundy filed a motion for change of venue, which was granted, but it was to Colorado Springs, which had historically hostile juries and murder trials. On the night of December 30th, with the most of the jail staff on Christmas break and nonviolent prisoners on furlough with their families, Bundy piled books and files into his bed and covered them with a blanket to look like his sleeping body and climbed into the crawl space. He broke through the ceiling into the apartment of the chief jailer, who was out for the evening with his wife. He changed into street clothes from the jailer's closet and walked right out the front door to freedom. After stealing a car, Bundy drove out of Glenwood Springs, but the car soon broke down in the mountains on Interstate 70. A passing motorist gave him a ride to Vail, 60 miles to the east. Imagine later on you found out you gave a ride to Ted Bundy. You helped him escape, and he killed more people. That has to feel awful. From there, Bundy caught a bus to Denver, where he boarded a morning flight to Chicago. In Glenwood Springs, the jail's skeleton crew did not discover the escape until noon the next day, more than 17 hours later. By then, Bundy was already in Chicago. From Chicago, Bundy traveled by train to Ann Arbor, Michigan, where he had the balls to visit a local bar out in the open on January 2nd. Five days later, he stole a car and drove south to Atlanta, where he boarded a bus and arrived in Tallahassee, Florida, on the morning of January 8th. He stayed one night at the Holiday Inn Hotel before he rented a room under the alias Chris Hagen at a boarding house near the Florida State University campus. Bundy later said that he initially resolved to find legitimate employment and refrain from further criminal activity, knowing he could probably remain free and undetected in Florida indefinitely as long as he didn't attract the attention of police. But his loan job application at a construction site had to be abandoned when he was asked to produce identification. He reverted to his old habits of shoplifting and stealing money and credit cards from women's wallets left in shopping carts at local grocery stores. In the early hours of January 15, 1978, one week after his arrival in Tallahassee, Ted Bundy entered FSU's Chi Omega sorority house through a rear door with a broken lock. Beginning at about 2.45 a.m., he bludgeoned Margaret Bowman, 21, with a piece of oak firewood as she slept then strangled her with a nylon stocking. He then entered the bedroom of 20-year-old Lisa Levy and beat her unconscious, strangled her, tore one of her nipples, bit deeply into her left buttock, and sexually assaulted her with a hairspray bottle. In an adjoining bedroom, he attacked Kathy Kleiner, breaking her jaw and deeply lacerating her shoulder, and Karen Chandler, who suffered a concussion, broken jaw, loss of teeth, and a crushed finger. Chandler and Kleiner survived the attack, Kleiner attributed their survival to car headlights that lit up the interior of their room and frightened Bundy away. Tallahassee detectives determined that the four attacks took place in a total of less than 15 minutes, within earshot of more than 30 witnesses who heard absolutely nothing. After leaving the sorority house, Bundy broke into a basement apartment eight blocks away and attacked FSU student Cheryl Thomas, dislocating her shoulder and fracturing her jaw and skull in five places. She was left with permanent deafness and equilibrium damage that ended her dance career. On Thomas's bed, police found a semen stain and a pantyhose mask containing two hairs similar to Bundy's in class and characteristic. On February 8th, Bundy drove 150 miles east to Jacksonville in a stolen FSU van. In a parking lot, he approached 14-year-old Leslie Parmenter, the daughter of Jacksonville Police Department's chief of detectives, identifying himself as Richard Burton, fire department, but retreated when Parmenter's older brother arrived and challenged him. That afternoon, he backtracked 60 miles westward to Lake City. 
At Lake City Junior High School, the following morning, 12-year-old Kimberly Diane Leach was summoned to her homeroom by a teacher to retrieve a forgotten purse. She never returned to class. Seven weeks later, after an intensive search, her partially mummified remains were found in a pig shed near Suwannee River State Park, 35 miles from Lake City. She appeared to have been raped and then killed by cuts to the neck with a knife. On February 12th, with insufficient cash to pay for his overdue rent and a growing suspicion that police were closing in on him, Bundy stole a car and drove west across the Florida Panhandle. Three days later, at around 1 a.m., he was stopped by Pensacola police officer David Lee near the Alabama state line after a wants and warrants check showed his Volkswagen Beetle was stolen because, of course, he had stolen a Volkswagen Beetle. When told he was under arrest, Bundy kicked Lee's legs out from under him and took off running. Lee fired a warning shot, chased, and tackled Ted. The two struggled over the gun before the officer finally subdued and arrested Bundy. In the stolen vehicle were three sets of IDs belonging to female FSU students, 21 stolen credit cards, and a stolen television set. Also found were a pair of dark-rimmed, non-prescription glasses and a pair of plaid slacks. Later identified as the disguise worn by Richard Burton Fire Department in Jacksonville. As Lee transported the suspect to jail, unaware that he had just arrested one of the FBI's 10 most wanted fugitives, he heard Bundy say, I wish you had killed me. Following a change of venue to Miami, Bundy stood trial for the Chi Omega homicides and assaults in June 1979. The trial was covered by 250 reporters from five continents and was the first to be televised nationally in the United States. Despite the presence of five court-appointed attorneys, Bundy again handled much of his own defense. The attorneys helping him claimed that he was sabotaging his entire defense effort out of spite, distrust, and grandiose delusion. He was facing a possible death sentence, and all that mattered to him was apparently being in charge. According to Mike Minerva, a Tallahassee public defender and member of the defense team, a pre-trial plea bargain was negotiated in which Bundy would plead guilty to killing Levy, Bowman, and Leach in exchange for a 75-year prison sentence. Prosecutors agreed to the deal because the possibility of losing a trial were pretty good. Bundy, on the other hand, saw the plea deal not only as a means of avoiding the death penalty, but also as a tactical move. He could enter his plea, then wait a few years for evidence to disintegrate or become lost or for witnesses to die, move on, or retract their testimony. Once the case against him had deteriorated beyond repair, he could file a post-conviction motion to set aside the plea and secure an acquittal. At the last minute, however, Bundy refused the deal. Quote, it made him realize he was going to have to stand up in front of a whole world and say he was guilty, Minerva said. He just couldn't do it. At trial, testimony was presented from Chi Omega sorority members who saw Ted near the house, and one saw him with a stick of wood in his hand. Incriminating physical evidence included impressions of the bite wounds matched to castings of Bundy's teeth. The jury deliberated for less than seven hours before convicting him on July 24, 1979, of the Bowman and Levy murders, three counts of attempted first-degree murder and two counts of burglary. The trial judge imposed death sentences for the murder convictions. Six months later, a second trial took place in Orlando for the abduction and murder of Kimberly Leach. That trial went much like the previous, and he was found guilty. During the penalty phase of the trial, Bundy took advantage of an obscure Florida law, providing that a marriage declaration in court in the presence of a judge constituted a legal marriage. He was questioning former Washington State DES co-worker Carol Ann Boone, who had moved to Florida to be near Bundy, had testified on his behalf during both trials, and was again testifying on his behalf as a character witness. He asked her to marry him. She accepted, and Bundy declared to the court that they were legally married. Will you marry me? Yes, I will. And I do hereby marry you. That was all that was required uh, for them to be officially married in uh, the state of Florida. Author Stephen oh, Michaud visited Bundy numerous times on death row. He says he helped arrange the surprising courtroom proposal, even procuring rings from Tiffany and a wedding outfit for Bundy. I went to the a men's store and bought Ted some uh, a pair of khakis and a bow tie and some Argyle socks so he could look spiffy for the, for the occasion. Bundy and Boone even had a daughter, the result of a moment of cloak and dagger intimacy in prison. Carol told me that there were two ways to have sex. One was to sneak into the bathroom and the other one was behind the water cooler. A recent Netflix documentary featured audio of her speaking about how the baby was conceived. 
We kept looking out the window. There's a black car in the trail line. Carol Ann Boone believed Bundy's claims of innocence for many years. She finally divorced the serial killer in 1986 and lived in virtual obscurity for more than 30 years. According to a published report, Carol Ann Boone died about a year ago at age 70, finally coming to the realization the rest of the world already knew. Bundy was a monster responsible for the deaths of at least 30 women. On February 10, 1980, Bundy was sentenced for a third time to death by electrocution. In October 1981, Boone gave birth to a daughter and named Bundy as the father. Conjugal visits were not allowed at Rayford Prison, but inmates were known to pool their money in order to bribe guards to allow them intimate time alone with their female visitors. While in prison during appeals process, Bundy initiated a series of interviews with a couple of people. He mostly spoke in the third person to avoid what he called, quote, the stigma of confession. For the first time, he gave an insight into his thought process and details of his crimes. He recounted his career as a thief, confirming Liz's longtime suspicion that he had shoplifted virtually everything of substance that he owned. Quote, the big payoff for me, he said, was actually possessing whatever it was I had stolen. I really enjoyed having something that I had wanted and gone out and taken. Possession proved to be an important motive for rape and murder as well. Sexual assault, he said, fulfilled his need to totally possess his victims. At first, he said he killed his victims as a matter of expediency to eliminate the possibility of being caught. But later, murder became part of the adventure. The ultimate possession was, in fact, the taking of a life, he said, and then the physical possession of the remains. Ted Bundy considered himself to be an amateur killer, an impulsive killer, in his younger years, he said later he came into his prime, or predator phase, in 1974. Those words would indicate that killing started well before 1974, even though he never admitted to killing anyone before then. In July 1984, Rayford guards found two hacksaw blades that Bundy had hidden in his cell. A steel bar in one of the cell's windows had been sawed completely through at the top and bottom and glued back into place with a homemade soap-based adhesive. Several months later, guards found an unauthorized mirror hidden in his cell, and Bundy was again moved to a different cell. Shortly thereafter, he was charged with a disciplinary infraction for unauthorized correspondence with another high-profile criminal, John Hinckley Jr., who had attempted to kill President Ronald Reagan. In 1986, after an execution date was set, Bundy finally began to officially confess to many of the murders he was suspected of or convicted of. He gave details about the murders. And he described how oftentimes he went back to where he dumped his victims' bodies and performed sex acts on their decomposing bodies until they were so decomposed that it wasn't possible anymore. He had decapitated about 12 of his victims with a hacksaw blade and often kept several of the heads in his apartment for a period of time before disposing of them. He explained that when he was in Utah, he could bring his victims back to his apartment where he could reenact scenarios depicted on the covers of detective magazines. After multiple stays of execution and delay tactics, a date was finally established as the day Bundy would be killed. On January 24, 1989, at 7.16 a.m., Ted Bundy died in the Rayford electric chair. Hundreds of revelers sang, danced, and set off fireworks in a pasture across from the prison as the execution was carried out then cheered as the white hearse containing Bundy's corpse departed the prison. He was cremated in Gainesville, and his ashes were scattered at an undisclosed location in the Cascade Range of Washington State in accordance with his will. Ted Bundy was an unusually organized and calculating criminal who used extensive knowledge of law enforcement methodologies to elude identification and capture it for years. His crime scenes were dispersed over large geographic areas. His victim count had risen to at least 20 before it became clear that numerous investigators and far jurisdictions were hunting the same man. His assault methods of choice were blunt trauma and strangulation, two relatively silent techniques that could be accomplished with common household items. He deliberately avoided firearms due to the noise they made and the ballistic evidence they left behind. He was a meticulous researcher who explored his surroundings in minute detail, looking for safe sites to seize and dispose of victims. He was unusually skilled at minimizing physical evidence, his fingerprints were never found at a crime scene, nor any other solid evidence of his guilt, a fact he repeated often during the years in which he had attempted to maintain his innocence. 
All of Bundy's known victims were white females, most of middle-class backgrounds, almost all were between the ages of 15 to 25, and most were college students. He apparently never approached anyone he might have met before. In part one and part two, you heard clips from an interview that Ted Bundy gave right before his execution, where he basically blamed pornography as the reason he was the way he was. I'm sure you guessed it already, but he was just catering to the agenda that he knew James Dobson had, who is the interviewer and founder of his organization, Focus on the Family. He used Dobson as a sort of final plea for leniency, or at the very least, more media attention. It was noted that most of the identified victims had long, straight hair parted in the middle, like Stephanie Brooks, the woman who had rejected him and to whom he had later been engaged and rejected her in return. After Bundy's execution, author Anne Rule was surprised and troubled to hear from numerous, quote, sensitive, intelligent, kind young women who wrote or called to say they were deeply depressed because Bundy was dead. Many of them had corresponded with him, each believing that she was his only one. Several said that they had suffered nervous breakdowns when he died. Even in death, Ted damaged women, Rule wrote. To get well, they must realize that they were conned by the master conman. They were grieving for a shadow of a man that never existed. One final quote from Ted Bundy that sums up the mindset of the most notorious serial killer in American history. I don't feel guilty for anything. I feel sorry for people who feel guilt. That's today's 10-Minute Murder, the ordinarily brief and bingeable true crime podcast. Thanks for listening today, and if you have a story you'd like for me to possibly cover on 10-Minute Murder, email it to 10minutemurder at gmail.com. Connect with me on social media, and be sure to tell your friends they're into brief true crime stories about this podcast. Lastly, if you listen on Apple Podcasts, first of all, I think it's getting better. When they changed things up the way they were doing it, There were huge delays in getting the episodes to you, but I think it's a lot better now, and hopefully it continues to improve. But if you listen on Apple Podcasts, be sure to rate and review five stars. Doing that helps the show grow and reach many more weirdos like you and I. Thank you for listening to 10 Minute Murder. Have a good night.